Hello, Paul Beckwith. So I'm continuing um, on my previous video where I'm talking about some of the characteristics of the virus, the physical characteristics, how it's made, how it interacts with various surfaces, how soap pulls it apart, how it lodges into, how it gets into the body, lodges into lungs, how it is transported and sneezes and coughs and things like that. So I'll just continue um, on where I left off in the previous video. Okay, so how long does the virus stay active on a surface? It depends. The SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is thought to stay active on favorable surfaces for hours, possibly a day. If the humidity is higher in the location, that will, the virus won't last as long. Moisture actually dissolves the virus on the surface. Uh, if in sunlight, especially UV light, that will destroy the virus. In 1918, the Spanish uh, influenza, um, so 102 years ago, field hospitals were outside in the sun. Mortality rates were 10, 12, 15% as opposed to 30 or 40% when these field hospitals were outside because sunlight really did a great job of disinfecting things. Heat or molecular motion all makes the virus less stable. Another reason why, why um, it won't live as long on surfaces in the summer when the sun's out and, and it's hotter. Now the skin is an ideal surface for a virus because it's organic and the proteins and fatty acids in the dead cells on the surface of the, on the surface of the skin interact with the virus through both hydrogen bonds and these fat-like hydrophilic interactions. That's where one end of the molecule loves to go to the fat side, the other end loves to go to the water side. When you touch, say, a steel surface with a virus particle on it, the virus particle will stick to your skin and hence get transferred onto your hands, but you're not yet infected. If you touch your face, so the virus can get transferred from your hands and onto your face. <clears throat> now the virus is dangerously close to the airways and the mucus type membranes in and around your mouth and eyes. So the virus can get in and voila, you are infected. That is unless your immune system kills the virus. And this, this is a, a crucial question I don't know the answer to, but is there a threshold before you get infected? Do you, is there, is, do you for example, completely guessing numbers, you know, maybe up to nine virus, um, super virus nanoparticles in your body, and maybe it stimulates an some sort of weak immune response and doesn't infect you. Maybe 10 is a critical number and it takes you over. You know, if that's the case, um, then, you know, way more people could would, would possibly have just a few virus particles in them and have a very weak immunity developing. And I don't know if that's going on in China or not, but it's a question I'm asking. I, you know, I'll have to research it. And if you see, come across anything, then please uh, leave it in a comment on the video. Um, if the virus is on your hand, you can pass it on by shaking someone else's hand. Kisses, of course, obvious. Don't do that with strangers, you know, <laughs> it comes without saying that if someone sneezes right in your face, you're kind of stuffed. Okay, and uh, that was the first 25 posts, so we'll keep going about the uh, soap. So soap, uh, about soap, supramolecular chemistry and viruses. How often do you touch your face? It turns out most people touch your face once every two to five minutes. Although Trump never touches his face. He's, he's, a, the genie. he's a genius, he never touches his face. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, so you are at high risk once the virus gets on your hands, unless you can wash the active virus off. So let's try washing it off with plain water. It might work, but water only competes with the strong glue-like interactions between the skin and virus via, via the hydrogen bonds, the hydrogen bonds between the water and the virus instead. And, you know, it's a toss up. The virus can be, is quite sticky and may not budge, especially if it's a rough surface and it's lodged in one of the depressions on the surface. Water is not enough. Soapy water is totally different. 
Soap contains fat-like substances known as the amphiphiles, and I talked about in the last video. They're very structurally similar to the lipids in the virus membrane. The soap molecules compete with the lipids in the virus membrane. So here we've got these soap molecules. There's a polar side and a non-polar side, water-loving side, fat-loving side. Um, here's bacteria living in the dirt or viruses. The soap goes in, the tail attaches to these, and the water-loving side, the polar side, gets pulled out to the water, and it pulls the, the dirt apart. It pulls the bacteria off of the dirt. Okay, soap molecules also compete with a lot of other non-covalent bonds that help the proteins, RNA, and lipids stick together. So the soap is effectively dissolving the glue, the lipids that hold the virus together. Add to that all the water. The soap also outcompetes the interactions between the virus and the skin surface. Soon the virus gets detached and falls apart like a pack of cards. It's annihilated through the combined action of the soap and water. It takes time, you know, you need 20 seconds of good washing in order, I can't emphasize that strongly enough, in order to get rid of those virus particles. The skin is quite rough and wrinkly, so you need a fair amount of rubbing and soaking and time to ensure the soap reaches every crook and nanny on the skin surface that could be hiding active viruses. Okay, now this trend, um, yeah, th this guy did a post in Icelandic, it took off, then he's done it in English. If you can translate, then please translate this to your given language, acknowledge this guy, and, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's work together and try to, uh, you know, point out the misconceptions that are occurring on, you know, the why, you know, hand sanitizer, why it's sold out, you know, plain old soap. Can't emphasize that enough. Now, I do have a bit of time to talk about some other very key things about the virus and lessons, you know, that we can learn from it. Okay, so, so first of all, and many of you are probably aware of this, the, the number of cases, confirmed cases, and this was from a while ago, so these aren't current numbers, this was this was a while back and it was mostly in China. We had confirmed cases and the percent of fatal cases and the age range. So, you know, this is why, you know, if we do not take care, our older population is likely to be annihilated from, from this disease. Okay. Um, and what other key points? Uh, it talks about the different, you know, where the virus is from. Um, basically, uh, da, 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 da. so common cold virus is these coronaviruses, basically. So we get these, this is the, um, field virology showing the phylogeny of the nidovirally order. And we've got the coronaviruses here, different types of coronaviruses, some causing colds, and this one derived from that. Okay, so here we go. There, there's the picture I showed you. Um, coronavirus is the cause of approximately 10 to 30% of colds, for example. They're important causes of disease in livestock. Once they get into livestock, they can then mutate. And, uh, you know, if they cross the species barrier, they can go to human. This is exactly what happened uh, with the coronavirus. Um, and, uh, you know, there was the SARS coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus. This is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Um, and then this beast here, the one we have now, they're notable for their significant mortality rates, much higher than flu rates. Okay, and I talked about those rates in the previous video. This goes above my pay grade. It talks about the receptors on the cells that where, where the virus binds to and the number of receptors can vary in different populations and things like that. Um, so people, some people can be more at risk than, than other people. And uh, if you, know, if you, if you uh, want, you can read the nitty, nitty, the nitty gritty details um, and of course the real problem is the, you know, all hospital systems 
will be swamped during a pandemic, you really want to lower the peak of the pandemic. Spread it out so that the hospitals can save as many people as possible. There's limited machines, et cetera, et cetera. So one really um, bizarre thing that I thought of, not recommended, but it seems to me that, you know, when the hospitals are completely swamped and there's huge numbers of people that are sick, the death rates could be three, four, five percent when the hospitals are fully functioning and efficient, the death rates could be 10 times lower, 0.4%, something like that, which is still, which is still um, at least four, you know, four, maybe 10 times higher than, than the flu, normal flu mortality rate. So, you know, if you get sick right during the peak of the pandemic, you're, you're, you're 10 times more likely to, to die than if you got sick when the hospitals are fully functional. So it's just, uh, just something to, to think about, you know, if you, they want volunteers, but you know, the growth rates are so huge. Um, I think, you know, most people have missed that window for, for, uh, you know, and who would risk it? I mean, there, there's all kinds of other things that would assume that the mutations and the evolution of the virus um, doesn't make it weaker. You know, the natural evolution process over time, you know, things mutate and they change. I mean, the doubling period of this virus is so quick that um, things change over, over time, right? So, um, you know, we think that as time proceeds, if the lethality of the virus changes, that it will reduce over time. Um, and the reason for that is that, uh, you know, if a mutation caused a virus to be more uh, potent, more deadly, that it would kill the host a lot more quickly, and they'd probably have symptoms a lot earlier, and therefore they wouldn't be able to spread it to as many people. But a weakening mortality rate, you know, don't forget, I mean, you know, it's, it's not in, in the interest of the virus that the host that it infects dies. So you know, that would evolve, lead, lead evolution to, and the mutations, which then, you know, are part of evolution. You get mutations, a whole bunch of mutations, and some of them are successful, and they became part of the, part of the virus um, mechanisms, if you like. So over time, in, in general, these things should, should weaken. Um, but, you know, and is it, is it seasonal? Um, you know, that's a big question. We can't hold out for that. And this is why you know, in my opinion, uh, you know, Boris Johnson and Trump, you know, trying to show, well, we haven't d controlled this thing, you know, but it's going to die out, you know, as, as the warmer weather comes. I mean, you know, look, there's lots of infections right now in Australia, and we're in the Australian uh, summer, um, you know, coming to fall. So um, don't think that's the case. So, but again, uh, you know, the big question that I have is, okay, so you get this thing going widespread in Hubei, you know, which is where Wuhan is, the main city. Uh, 80 million people roughly in that region. And uh, the thing starts catching on like crazy. There's more and more diagnostic cases. Um, in retrospect, they work back and find the true cases is, you know, 1,500 versus 100 diagnosed, 2,500 actual cases versus 400 diagnosed, and they shut the city. Okay, um, and then the very next day they realized they needed to shut the surrounding regions. So they shut the 15 surrounding regions and lo and behold, after a short period of time, the true cases started to decrease and they're continuing to decrease and the surrounding regions that were beginning that exponential curve, they flattened out. They've gone almost completely flat. If you look at the data from the previous paper that I discussed. Um, so the question is, is why? I mean, most people there did not get infected, or maybe they did at such low levels, they developed some sort of immunity. Anyway, there's lots of questions, lots of clues in this. I have to think about it a lot more. Anyway, thank you for listening, and uh, stay safe. Bye for now.